A new segment I'm introducing onto this channel is a monthly book club and I hope you will join me on this journey. If our first book club, I'm going to be sharing some lessons and insights that I gathered from Cal Newport's new book, Slow Productivity. Cal Newport is a professor at Georgetown. He has a PhD from MIT and he writes a lot around productivity. One of the reasons I picked this book to read first is, is actually the premise of the book, right? So I have felt that in the last decade or so, there, have, there has definitely been a rise of influences that are in the productivity space that encourage you to do this and this, how I got this done in 30 days. And, and there's all that stuff on the internet, right? And sometimes, it can make you feel as a knowledge worker and knowledge worker is a term that Carl uses in his book. Um, I think it's, it's not a term that he coined, um, but it's a term he uses it in the book to describe people like maybe you and I who do not do manual labor like construction work or farming, right? That's really different. And I don't think the principles in slow productivity would necessarily apply to those types of jobs. Although, you know, I'm sure you could fit them somehow, but this, this book really focused on knowledge workers. Okay. And a subsequent Gallup poll showed, and this is from the book, that American workers are now amongst the most stressed in the world. And, you know, it's again related to the premise I stated earlier that there has been this rise in productivity, 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 and output, output, output. Um, and this leads to burnout and ultimately companies suffer. So how do we solve that? And that's where the book starts. So slow productivity is broken down into, or the principles of slow productivity are broken down into three. The first one is do fewer things. Second one is work at a natural pace. And the third is obsess over quality. Okay. So let's talk about doing fewer things. So one of the, the things I really enjoyed, I think this is the part of the book I enjoyed the most. Now I will say that the book reads more like an academic piece, although there were points in the book where I was laughing because, you know, Cal has this dry sense of humor maybe. So, you know, it's not easy at first to like get going, but once you get going, it's actually quite interesting. So doing fewer things over here, there was this overarching theme of limiting your missions or ultimately limiting your goals. Now mission sounds very grandiose, right? But just replace missions with goals. So let's take a typical academic, for instance, who works in academia. You have to teach, you have to mentor students, you have to grade papers, you have to maybe work on some committees, maybe you're also doing research on top of that. There's so many things that you have to do. And what happens is that a lot of us, we elevate all of these tasks and missions and goals to the same level, right? But while it's really, you know, and, and Carl said this in the book as well, why it's really difficult to focus on just one or two things to do, right? Once the number of missions you have as a knowledge worker exceeds five, that's when you begin to lose your mind, okay? And, and, and I find this true in my own life, right? That when my number of goals exceeds three, it just gets crazy and wild. And so what he recommends in this part of the book uh, under this principle of doing fewer things is limit the number of missions you have in any given time. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about this in terms of quarters. I work outside of academia and usually we think in terms of Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4, right? And so three month chunks. And so I was thinking that every quarter, and this is something I actually have implemented in my work life, where I have three major missions per quarter, right? Because like I was saying, one or two is, is, is almost impossible for most people, right? But then five, and above also gets to be too crazy. So I have found a happy medium around three missions per quarter. And during this quarter, every activity I do every day is designed to move these missions forward. And it makes it so that at the end of the quarter, I have something tangible versus having five or six or 10 and all of them are like half done 
by the end of the quarter so really like when I was reading this part I was just like nodding my head and be like yes 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 you know I absolutely loved it so now that you define so that, that's my recommendation that was what I pulled out of this part is then this is G right this is G not Cal but G saying limit your workload maybe to three major missions per quarter right or maybe in a semester you if you work in academia you can think of it differently and of course once you have that overarching mission then you can break it down into projects and then you can break it down into daily tasks to help you reach that mission one thing I also really loved, which I'm not really doing right now and I want to start implementing, is that once you come up with your overarching mission or missions, right, your, let's say your three, you adopt my principle, right, and you decide on your three overarching missions for a quarter, then it's time to block off your calendar, right? So I talked about how you have the overarching mission, you break it down into projects, and then you break it down into daily tasks. So now that you've broken it down into daily tasks, you can begin to block times out on your calendar that allow you to focus, allow you to do what, you know, again, Cal, in another book, calls deep work on these projects, right? This may look like two hours in a day or three hours in a day, usually, I personally find that two to three hours of doing deep work is enough for me to move my project significantly ahead. And so you book or you block your time on that calendar so that people are not scheduling meetings over that, so that when people reach out to you and say, hey, do you have 30 minutes to discuss this? You can look at your calendar and fit this in the appropriate slot instead of fitting it in the time where you will be doing your deep work. I find that this also really helps you to control incoming requests because if you have three or four overarching missions within your quarter and you're focused on that, then when there is an incoming request that you feel, okay, is going to overshadow and take up more time than is necessary and will hinder what you have set up as your major missions, right, you can then of course, you don't, you know, one of the things that was in the book was um, <laughs> that Kyle talked about in the book is like, if you say something like I'm busy, everybody is busy if you really think about it, but you'll be able to say something like, and I really like the script that he gave in the book and I'm going to read it verbatim for you. It says, I don't see any really significant swaths of open time to work on something like this for the next three weeks. In the meantime, I have these other projects that are competing for my schedule. And I have used a variation of this when people have reached out for me to work on something and I'm looking at my calendar and I'm thinking, you know, overall in the next quarter or in the next one month, maybe I can't do this, but how about we touch base again at this point in time? So you are not telling them that you're busy. You're not always rejecting things outright, even though, you know, maybe sometimes that becomes necessary, but you are framing it to say that I don't see the way my schedule is set up right now. I don't see any open swaths of time to work on this. And so I'd like to touch base in three weeks or four weeks and we can talk more about this. I know that this is not always going to be easy. This is not always going to be met with smiles, but generally if you frame it this way, I have found that people have been open and receptive to messaging like that. Principle number two is working at a natural pace. If you think about human history and you think about even all the geographical areas in the world, right? Each of the geographical areas in the world has a month or a few months where the weather is not as forgiving, right? And usually during these times, people may be indoors, work may slow down a little bit. And so in, in, you know, in the more temperate regions of the world, maybe that looks like winter. In some parts of the world, that looks like the really hot seasons, things slow down, right? And so we've had this history of we work, 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 and then there is some time for us, there is some downtime, right? And this was true with people that farm, 
people that hunt, people that used to do this type of work. However, with industrialization and the rise of technologies, right? Technologies like our cell phones that are that have super fast internet, allow us to message anybody anywhere in the world at any time and do work that once was not possible for us to hold in the palm of our hands we have found ourselves in a situation technology is great but we found ourselves in a situation where we're always on or we're always working or always feel like we need to be working or need to be productive right but that's not healthy i don't know about you but that's not healthy and and this is why working at a natural pace is also i really love loved this principle so much because it's taking us back to you know back to those times of like resting for three months or something like that right but back to where it's like we embrace seasonality and so what does this really look like in a knowledge worker's life one of the the insights i really really agreed with in this book was the fact that sometimes your best insights don't come when you are frantically working on something so in my work i look at data a lot i read a lot of things and then i write a lot of things right and so for me, it's important that sometimes I remove myself from my work. And sometimes some of my best insights don't come when I'm sitting there with the Word document open and I'm typing. Sometimes it comes as I decide to leave my desk and go outside and walk for 30 minutes. And right now in my current work life, this is a really something that I do, that during the course of my work day, I do take a break, not just to have lunch, but I take a break where I go outside, leave the building and go walk in the sun for 30 minutes. Sometimes I'm listening to something, but sometimes I actually leave my cell phone behind. And as I'm walking, without sometimes actually actively thinking about it, there'll be connections being made that I wasn't able to make when I was typing at my computer right and then i'd be like oh let me let me like shelve that idea for when i get back to my desk and when i get back to my desk maybe i'll jot it down really quickly type it up really quickly and then come back to it right so that's one example of of just like these are micro breaks you can take during your day that can actually help to rejuvenate and make connections that you would otherwise not make if you were just frantically working and i realize that this is really counterintuitive to you know a lot of of, of work environments <laughs> again so this is why in a way you know the, this book was a bestseller and maybe <laughs> it was a bestseller for various reasons but maybe you know it's challenging the the paradigm of frenetic work that some that leaves people burnt out doesn't like frowns on breaks and even taking naps i remember this so clearly like when i was growing up okay my father who worked as a research scientist for most of his career worked at an institution and during lunch time they actually were allowed to go home because i mean it was basically sort of like a campus and have lunch and i remember sometimes my dad taking like a 30 minute nap I don't even think naps are a thing. <laughs> I don't know. They're like, let me know. Do you take naps? Like sometimes I even feel guilty taking a nap. And yet this type of rest could be exactly what we need to be even more productive. And a really important point related to this is having the ability to forgive yourself and realize that you taking a break, you taking your PTO, you taking a nap, I don't know, not at work though, I don't want you to get in trouble, but you taking these natural breaks that allow you to rejuvenate and allow you to think about your work are actually not bad and to like forgive yourself if at the end of the day, yes, you're working on that project, but you get to a point where it's like the idea is not gelling, right? Or the words the, that you want to say, they're not coming out the way you want to say them or, or you didn't quite finish grading the papers you wanted to grade or you didn't quite finish something. Forgive yourself, especially if you continue the next day to work towards that. And so, I again, I really loved this point about working at a natural pace and allowing breaks, normalizing breaks, normalizing seasonality, normalizing that sometimes you will not finish your work and 
if you are working at a natural pace and if you are doing everything else that we're talking about, you'll still finish on time, but for giving yourself in between. I, I just thought that that was good. Principle number three was obsess over quality. Now this third one, I had some trouble with just because I feel like it has the potential to slow some people down, right? Especially if you have perfectionist tendencies. <laughs> Hello to all the perfectionists. I used to be like that. I'm not really like that anymore um, because I just like to create things and then you know, I think Seth Godin said this way, ship them. Like I create it and then put it out there. Now I will say, however, that if you are working at a natural pace and taking the breaks you need to take and allowing yourself to rejuvenate and make the connections that your brain needs to make, right? Your work will be quality. And the reason I say that is, is, is because as I was thinking about this and about how I work, right, I realized that when, for instance, I have to write a piece, I have to write, let's say I have to write an application note to a white paper um, or even a peer reviewed paper. Usually what I'll do is I will write that first draft, right? I'll write that first draft, which often is pretty terrible. It's not great, right? And then I put it away um, and may end up working on another mission, another goal. And then I come back to it about a week later and I begin to read it again. And as I read it again, I begin to see where my gaps are. Maybe during that time, you know, in between, I may be reading, I may have some discussions, I may have some experiences that are like, ooh, I should really include that in what I'm writing. And this is true for whether I'm writing, doing my scientific writing, I also write fiction, writing my fiction, or even writing LinkedIn posts, right? Whatever it is I'm writing, the time, the, a lot of the time I will in it, write the initial piece, go leave it alone and come back and allow myself to see it with fresh eyes and improve upon it so it's a much more quality product than what I produced before. Because to be honest, we can always make things better, right? Um, and so uh, this, this point about obsessing over quality, when I was reading it, I was having some trouble with it just because the, the examples that he used were not as as relatable but as i began to think about it i began to think about my own experiences and how i obsess over quality and it was really tied to the the idea of working at that natural pace where you're taking breaks where you're leaving the thing and then coming back to it where maybe during those breaks you expose yourself to more experiences and more material that allow you to come back and make that thing even more more <laughs> all right so yeah this book was great um i gave it a four out of five stars the only reason being that sometimes it was it got a little academic but it was a really good read i highly recommend it for this book club i'll be putting all the books in my amazon storefront right here at this link and so you can check that out until next time